Hello and welcome. Our next speaker today is Juan Bernabe from Telefonica, who will talk to us about managing data in startups. Please welcome Juan with a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Welcome, Campuseros. Um, yeah, I'm going to just. I have three topics for you, three blocks. Very different ones, very various blocks. The first one is related to the most frequently asked questions about data and startups. Yeah? We've been engaging with startups, uh, startups um, from the very beginning. We started in our project. And yeah, I brought for you the top, I think, six or seven questions we need to give answers um, if you're in a startup. Then I'm going to present the, what we call the innovation challenge. So something the startup needs to be aware of when it's about dealing with data. And then as a bonus track, I brought you, a, well, I dare to give you kind of an art lesson on data insights, yeah? So you're going to like this one, for sure. So, uh, startups, questions, yeah? So um, what I'm doing telephone guys, I'm just uh, running the Pro Big Data Lab um, a team. What we do is basically we take data and we ta turn data into products. As simple as that, yeah? Sounds simple, it's not simple, but well. What we are doing as well is we are giving support all along uh, to uh, startups uh, from Waira. So you got the Waira corner there in many countries. For I'm, I'm located in Germany, so I kind of, uh, I'm more close to the German startups, but also um, to the Spanish startups, Brazilian startups, and also UK startups. Yeah? What I brought for you here today is kind of uh, the top six questions. When you engage with a startup, you're going to be asked. Yeah? And the very first question is kind of obvious, yet important. Yeah? Should I care about the data? Yeah? Because many startups, they don't have time for data. Well, they are very busy just putting together business cases, uh, running business, uh, talking to partners. And they, the first thing they told me is, what you are doing is really interesting, but do I have to care? The answer is, well, you don't, ha you don't have any choice. Why? Because your business is there in the middle of the digital age. And you cannot escape from there. You cannot change it. Even if you are running a 3D uh, printing business, you need to be aware of all the things that your competitors are doing and they are taking advantage of. Yeah? Talking about just uh, getting an early response for the market. I'm talking about yeah, trying new ways of engaging with customers, testing new propositions, uh, quantify the satisfaction because it's about your customer at the end, and many other things. Yeah? So to the first question, do I have to care as a startup? Even if you are not related to data, you have to. Next one. Well, we talk about data, we talk about value. Where's the value in the data? That's a uh, very common question. Yeah? I remember talking to, to a team just uh, running a business about creating communities uh, for social shopping. And they were asking these questions. And we are gathering data, but where's the value there? Yeah? Is the data, is the logs of, on my server, is uh, the reports I create? The question is, the answer is C below, yeah? As you got data, and your data is valuable. No questions about that. Your data is probably valuable, yeah? Whether you see the value or not, yeah. It's a matter of having a deeper analysis. But then, you increase the value, just turning your data into insights. Insights kind of... Uh, Turning the raw data into something you can make sense of, so make sense of. And in this process, we got something that is very hype at the moment, which is called data science. Yeah? That's what you need. Then your insights are valuable, but your insights need to drive actions. And for these actions, you need further ingredients like, well, your instinct, your beliefs, uh, expertise, and experience. The actionable insights is where you got the money, where the value is, yeah? And what you can turn into money as a startup, yeah? And then, of course, everything works fine, but you need to feed it back to the beginning. So you end up driving, uh, deriving results from your actions, and then it's really, really important that you close the loop 
That's so you gather more data as you create results, and you run everything through again. Yeah? Let's have a closer look at the action part. Yeah? This action part is uh, kind of related to a time scale. Yeah? You can take an action looking back to the past. You can just to understand, explain, learn, and plan, and discover the future from the past. You can just take real-time actions just to steer things you have on run, so ongoing, like online campaign, whatever, to monitor and react on time. And of course, this is, of course, the, you know, the premier league of the insights. You can anticipate and predict the future. By predicting the future, it's more complex, of course, but you might save a lot of money. And you might to take decisions, you might to kind of uh, try decisions without having to incur any cost, which is a, a lifesaver for a startup. Next question. Uh, very, um, not my favorite, but the more, the more controversial question. This data protection. Yeah? And keep in mind that I'm located in Germany, which is kind of uh, the topic about data. My answer to the data protection, what about data protection? You need to do it properly or keep your hands away from the data. Yeah? There's an open debate going on. Because you have some of overprotecting entities, and you have also uh, people trying to drive innovation. And sometimes they kind of um, get into conflicts. There's an open debate. Uh, UK is kind of uh, more open. Germany is uh, more close. Uh, Spain is uh, fine their own way still. That's the countries I know. So what's important is that you kind of uh, understand very well uh, customers' quotes like, you only use my data with my consent. Yeah, what does it mean? Or my data for a given purpose only. Yeah? It's really important. If your data is kind of a person specific, it's not your data. So you need to kind of uh, use it with the consent for a given purpose of your customer. If we talk about, well, I've anonymized, I've aggregated, I cannot go back to a particular individual, then you can do more things. Yeah? Depending on the country, you can be, yeah, you can use it as, as if it was yours, or you can just use, use it with more restrictions. But then it's, so the, the, the story changed. There's something that I always uh, bring up when I talk with, with one startup, which is the topic about opt-ins and opt-outs. So when you get a customer signing it for your service as a startup, there, uh, there are always uh, terms and conditions you need to be aware of. And there, there are the so-called opt-in clauses and opt-out clauses. Yeah? It's about uh, very f at the very first stage, you ask for permission. It's, can I use your data? I'm really interested in using your data. I'm going to use your data for A, B, and C. And then the customer probably is going to say yes, or maybe not, but you are safe. When we talk about data protection as well, it's really, really important to know for how long can I hold the data. Yeah? There are contradictory regulations. People speak about uh, you need to keep it for two years. Depending on the country, it's about six months. Or well, you can just aggregate it and archive it later. Contradicting topics. Well, then the next one is tricky question. What if somebody? Ask me to remove her records. How, how do you react as, as a startup to this question? Again, going back to the point uh, above, if this is a personal information without any opt-in or, um, or with one opt-in behind, but you have you think asked to delete it, you need to do it. If you've turned this information into something anonymized and aggregated, you know what? It's not your data uh, anymore. So it's kind of a, something very distant from you already. Yeah? So then what I suggest here in this case, uh, try to get confident with the regulations in your country. And that's, it's coming back to the next question. Does it, does it work all over the places? There's no magic formula for that. Yeah? So again, it's country specific, very country specific. Although the European Union is trying to do their best, but sometimes it's kind of challenging. And sometimes even within a country, there's a gray zone uh, ranging from very dark black to very you know, light gray. 
So get advice. Don't take um, unnecessary risks, but uh, don't feel yourself stop from the fact that you need to use the data to make uh, awesome things with. Next one. It's a really, I really like this one because um, first time uh, somebody asked me this question, uh, it was it took for me a while to kind of uh, come up with the right answers, and th this answer has been evolving over the time, and that's what I got today. What makes your, my data available? Actually, the big fives. Yeah? The first one of the big fives is kind of the elephant, the big data elephant, the, the animal the big data animal, which is, but in this case, the, this elephant is kind of reflecting the fact that you need history and you need volume. Yeah? The more history you have, the better, because the better you can understand the past. The more volume you have, the better, because uh, the, f the deeper the conclusions you can drive. Yeah? So, the next one is time, location, stamps. Yeah? Right, uh, so nowadays, um, we can get more than just timestamps. So we can just get a location of the data records. You should be gathering location all along, yeah? So please don't forget to include in your data strategy the you know, location stamp for your records. Because you can then run geographical queries and it's gonna be very, very beneficial. A speed, the, the layout part here. A speed is about you know, accessing the data real time, if possible or um, kind of uh, processing very quick, very quickly. So you don't have to wait uh, for ages to run a report to get insights that might be out of date when you get them, yeah? That's the worst thing that can happen to you. See, so the data uh, got a window of opportunity, a window of utility, and you need to hit this window as well. The next one is uh, com combinability, yeah? So you need to be able to find links to other data sources. Why? Because then, by merging data sources, what you do is you increase the value of both. Very important here, the point that um, with all the initiatives going on about open APIs and so on, this is going to be the kind of the, the most important aspect if your data is not rich enough. So if you really, if you got data, you think it's valuable, you are not sure, but actually, if I combine it with other data from a partner, or if I buy data, or if I just consume freely available data, I can do awesome things as well. And the last one, the buffalo is kind of structure. The better the structure is, the more valuable the data. If you just store, say, tweets with less structure, the value is there, but it's kind of um, very rudimentary. So you need to apply some clever science just to make the most of this data and give it some structure that you can query, you can export, expose. For me, those are the big fights. Yeah. Next one. That's the one million dollar question, which is, but how can I make money with my data? Yeah? So when I talk to people, they get very excited about data, value, well, awesome, I need to do that, I need to do that, but what exactly? Um, difficult because there are many ways, so many questions, uh, difficult to get the proper answer. What I've done is based on this uh, value chain we described before. Um, I've identified five ways of um, kind of uh, running a, I want to make money with my data strategy. Yeah? Those are, if you don't have to care about turning your data into insights because you don't have time, you can wholesale it. Yeah? For example, I just uh, give a partner, I sell my logs to a partner, and my partner is going to be able to kind of uh, increase the value by applying uh, in data science and turning it into insights. That is the very first one. The second one is kind of um, you got your data, and what you do is instead of uh, giving away your DNA, what you do is you turn it into something more uh, you have more control on, and you can decide how, what you share, what you don't share, which is you open up an API. Might be sophisticated, might be simple, but you got the control on your data. Yeah? What you can do as well uh, as a third point, which is kind of derived from the first one, is, well, I don't know what to do with my data, but I can give you my data and you give me your data because I think it's more valuable for me and I make 
sense of this data you are giving me, yeah? so that you combine, it's the combination piece. The fourth one is based on the open API concept as well. It's about the trading piece. Yeah? It's, uh, those are very, fr th in, in the startup incubator communities, yeah? I really see it happening very frequently, this inside trading. Yeah? So I'm gathering logs from a customer, from my ca people just uh, going and shopping. You are gathering logs from um, the internet activities about related products. And what if we trade? So I give you access to my API, you give, me, you, you give me access to your API. So at the end, it's a win-win situation, and it's a way of monetizing it on top, yeah? The fifth one is kind of uh, for the, I mean, for the people just uh, willing to base their own business on data, yeah? That's where we are in Telefonica Dynamic Insights, so you create your own data products. It's about kind of uh, moving from this API's concept to turning your data into something you sell. So you sell a package, a product, a report. Yeah? This, is, that's the, this first row is what you can do with your data regarding others. Yeah? But something that for me is uh, the, the, the core, you need to be your best customer. So you need to monetize your data for yourself. Yeah? Uh, so you need to run your business just based on data and insights because of the several reasons we said at the beginning, yeah? So your competitor, uh, competitors are not sleeping and don't give them advantage because they know more than you know, yeah? So people call it a data-driven continuous improvement cycle and it's just like that, yeah? And again, following on that, yeah? The next question is, but how can I use data to improve my business? And the answer is, uh, don't worry about so much text. The answer is, you use your data, apply many, many uh, ways of gathering data, analyzing, and turning it into insights to do basically three things. To take the right decisions, to understand your customers, and to understand your market, yeah? One, let's take one example, take the right decisions. It's about, I'm not sure, what to do, how to present a certain front end to a customer, uh, because uh, I don't know it uh, very well. I'm a startup, I'm a starting. So what I do is I bring up three or four ways, almost done, but, not, but very quickly to in front of customers, three or four ideas, and I A-B test them. Yeah? I gather data in terms of uh, response of customers, in terms of uh, uh, how easy it was to get to the call to action button. So there are many ways of gathering um, A-B test data. But you take the right decision. So you don't take the risk of not, not analyzing the data. Yeah. Next one. People get excited again, but then, well, they think back of the business case again. Well, actually, um, you are telling me about data, but I don't have it in my business case. What do I do now, yeah? What do I need, yeah? Again, depending on your option of monetizing data, depending on your preference, these, four, uh, these five um, bullet points we mentioned before, you might have to cover these aspects. Yeah? Storing data, again, here, it's really, really, you need to start small. So you cannot start just buying a really, really expensive hardware structure to store data. You can do it in the cloud. You can do it just by buying a decent hard drive. You're a startup. Remember that. Storing data is something that I think, no matter which strategy you go for, is a must. Yeah. Then if you want to turn your data into insights yourself, you need to apply some discovering capabilities. Discovering in terms of uh, you need soft skills to do that. You, not, you need kind of... Um, data science skills. Yeah? You can hire them, you can create your own skills, you can vary the level of sophistications, but you need it. So you need to plan your cost for that. If you are going to run an API business, or if you're, uh, for yourself, for the trading, or just to expose it as an open service, you need to um, also cover the cost for exposing your insights, yeah? so, which might mean you need to kind of develop your own application, 
your own APIs, uh, your own services, one SSL plugin just to download your data. You need to kind of cover it as well. And if you dis plan to discover, uh, if you plan to expose, you need to cover the processing cost as well, because it's going to take you know, processing power to get to the insights and to expose them. Basically, those are the four topics. And again, depending on the country, you might have to put a basic or more sophisticated mechanism to make sure that you anonymize and aggregate your insights, your data. Yeah? So what I call securing. And of course, you protect your access to your data with the proper security mechanisms like well, SSL or whatever, a standard one. Questions, uh, the question regarding technology. The, I mean, big data, hype, uh, Hadoop, uh, MongoDB, many, many buzzwords for a startup, yeah? So they heard about that, and they feel like having to be related to this topic. The answer here for at the startup stage is technology matters, but not so much. Yeah? And what I suggest always is forget the big in the big data. It's about data first, yeah? And data you can't deal with because, I mean, you're gathering at the beginning a small amount of data. So don't worry about big data technologies. Worry about data. Then um, I've been asked also to, well, people talk about big data. Is this a myth? What is big data, yeah? So big data can be described as, as kind of two elements. You are your data scientist, so people applying all kinds of techniques to make your data talk, and you also got a technology stack. But this technology stack, again, is so it needs to be able to provide you with the ability to process uh, volumes of distant volumes of data within a reasonable time and reasonable cost. That's it. Yeah? So in terms of what you choose, whatever it fits for you. I mean, this is uh, your options. It's a mess, it's a jungle of technologies and buzzwords, but again, it's whatever fits for you. You need to find it for you. And I'm just uh, leaving the topic uh, questions from a startup, and I want just for the startups that care about uh, running, uh, starting a business based on insights, I want to kind of present this innovation versus customer-driven debate here. Yeah? Because all three quotes are real quotes from customers that we are working with. Yeah? Sometimes we came up with something we thought it was really, really cool, but then they told us, eh, thank you, actually, what you created, the data product you created is nice, but I'm not sure I need it. Yeah? That's the problem. So if you run and you create something uh, without any customer engagement, you end up having a nice solution for a problem nobody has. Yeah? That's the stream. So you need to involve the customer in the earlier stage to understand what exactly you are creating. Yeah? Uh, in the middle is, well, you engage with the customer, you took the feedback on board, and you end up creating something cool, uh, do, uh, fulfilling the customer needs. So they got a problem, you understood the problem, you kind of turned your data into something, giving solutions to this problem. But that's it, yeah? And then where you need to innovate is kind of in a place where you can get such a quote from your customer, yeah? So, wow, I didn't know it was possible. That's why I didn't ask for it. Huh? So don't expect to get everything you need from your customers. You need to bring your own ideas to explore the data, make the data talk. You go to a customer and you disrupt this business. That's the spirit of the startup, yeah? It's not staying here in the middle. It's not taking the risk of staying down there. It's about innovate and disrupt up there, yeah? That's what we call internally the innovation versus customer-driven challenge. And now, the bonus. It's an art lesson on data insights. This is about um, something very critical uh, when you are running a data business, which is how can I 
convey and present my insights in a way that I can just um, get the maximum of that. Yeah? What I've done is I've taken five artists from the Impressionism, so five masters, Delaunay, Renoir, Chagall, um, Serra and Picasso, and I've run two examples, two competing examples. Yeah? The way this artist saw the Eiffel Tower and the way our data in our product is, seeing, is giving the, uh, answers to the question where are uh, where people that has been here in this outdoor arena are coming from. Yeah? So question we need to answer here, where are people coming from to the outdoor arena, to the O2, so to this place? What they are trying to do, they are trying to paint the Eiffel Tower. Yeah? The first approach is what Serra did. It, this was the crazy artist just uh, with points creating awesome pieces of art. Yeah? He managed to create a macro view from the microcosmos, so from each and every point together. He managed to put together a macro picture. Yeah? When you have your insights very granular, yeah? sometimes you need to make sure that you put them together in a way that you give the image of the whole. Yeah? And that's what we have done. This is the O2 Arena in the middle, and this Shadings, they are telling where people came from, yeah? So where people live that have been here in the outdoor arena, yeah? What you see there is uh, three shadings, three colors. We got the red, we got the yellow, and the blue. The red is kind of uh, shading the locations, accounting for 50% of the total visitors of this place, yeah? The yellow one is accounting for the next 20%, yeah? And the blue one is accounting for the up to the 90%, yeah? so from the 70 to 90%. As you can see, a small pieces giving kind of a bigger picture. Yeah? The advantage of that is you can't just stay at the macro level, but you can go to the detail level as well. Yeah? This is this particular plate with Canary Wharf and so on. We also try to kind of apply the same technique. Of course, it's not that efficient in terms of visualization yeah? of Serra. The next master, the next artist, Renoir. Eiffel Tower, Renoir was the master of smoothing things. It's not about details, it's about, you know, I go broader, less granularity, but giving the same information. Yeah? And thus, you get the same information just kind of increasing the size of the shapes. Yeah? So, you are telling your customer with this representation. By the way, I can give you, I can tell you more or less the places where it's contributing the most to the what we call catchment or number of visitors of this place, and I can go back to the detail if required. But I don't want you to bother with the detail if you if you need to take a quick decision. Yeah? This was Renoir. Delaunay, or or the art of creating a new reality. It's the same. It's the Eiffel Tower, but kind of turn into something different here. Keeping details, but details kind of uh, in a different shape, yeah? So it's about getting your insights and turning, it, uh, turning them into something that is new, nobody has seen, and still keeping the same amount of information, uh, conveying the same value. And we created this porcupine, yeah? And this porcupine is kind of... Uh, showing in red the places and the directions contributing the most to the number of visitors of the outdoor arena, yeah? the porcupine. The last one, no, the, well, not the last one. We have, of course, the possibility of uh, moving away from visualizations and just uh, relying on kind of figures, and that's what we can have here is so a catch per distance level, the number of visitors coming versus the number of residents. So you need to keep also uh, the ability of giving this information always if you are asked to, huh? so that people just can work on the numbers, not on the shapes only. And the last one is kind of Chagall or, or the art of the storytelling. It's less about the tower, it's more about 
this lying lying lady on the bed is more about the moon is more about uh, the other aspects yeah? Chagall instead of saying well you got so many people I'm going to tell you what you got this particular day with being giving, giving insights for yeah? you got a big reunion concert the 14th of May yeah? and you got groups like Atomic Kitten Bewitched Liberty X 911, Honeyed. To be honest, I don't know many of them, but well, the thing is, it's a story you tell about your data. And you can just identify the fans, where the fans live of this particular group, yeah? And you can just tell things like, well, by the way, this particular 14th, 14th of uh, May, we got so many women coming, also so many female, instead of uh, less male, yeah? And you can even compare this 14th with another event, I think the 26th, where you got the inverted trend. So you got more male people than female people. Yeah? And you can even have the split by age. And you can tell, well, actually, as expected, um, the biggest group was the people between 20 and 29. Yeah? It's about telling the story. It's kind of relating your insights to something that happened and making it compelling and making it sellable for a customer. Yeah? Depending on whom you're talking to, you need to choose the right one. But keep in mind that there are many ways, and depending on your audience, they might be more effective or less effective. Yeah? And that's it from my side. Questions? Hugo. Um, so thank you very much to Juan Barnabé for this wonderful speech. And does anybody have any questions? Yes. Hi, Juan. Hi. Great presentation. Okay. <laughs> um, my question is, can you give us an example of, because you're, on your presentation you talked about using your own data. Mm -hmm. What about the open data? What about the data that is available online? Can you give us an example of how you have somehow used that to create added value on top of the data you already own? Yeah, I mean, we got data from, fruitful data from UK. We got, we know where people are coming from to places. We can, for example, get data available about the pollution, about where you got pollution incidents in London. We can get, for this pollution incidents, see how many people have been exposed to this pollution incident, and you can just, for these people, you can get to see where they live, and you can just get the index of the cancer, as a, uh, lungs cancer, yeah, for them, yeah? So it's kind of, you can relate the pollution to cancer. You, you have with your data, taking available data, to give an answer to a problem that people couldn't give an answer to. One, this could be one example. Hi there, Juan. Um, I have a question uh, with respect to aggregate data. Yep. And I'll, I'll give you a very specific example. Um, um, there is a company called TomTom who yep. gathers network data in aggregated manner, anonymized from the network, and uses this to um, improve the traffic prediction, if there are jams or not. Yep. Now, the users that subscribe to that service, sometimes they don't subscribe because it's their, their operator aggregating the data, so you don't know anything about the users. Mm -hmm. That is given to them, and then they use that. Here is though the case what happened. This company took that aggregated data and sold it to the government who used it with the police to figure out where people are speeding. Mm -hmm. Which then the aggregate data that was non you know anonymized and everything else at the end turned up to be very specific to some people that got the tickets. Mm -hmm. Now we can debate if they should be speeding or not, but it's just a case where the data is used in a way that no one would have ever thought it would be used for, and sometimes to the detriment of the person that gave the data. Very good example. Again, the power, the power in the data is kind of up to us, so up to what we do with the data. Yeah, You can use the data just to drive useful insights. In this case, they are driving use, useful insights for the government and for the police just to make sure that they control the people speeding up. Yeah? If it is kind of, um, I would say, legal or not, I, I, I don't know. Yeah? Because, but the thing is, I don't, I don't think anybody can give you a proper answer on that. 
I don't think there's a proper answer, but there, or there's one answer to this question. Yeah? It's a matter of debate. But it's a really, really good example. Hmm? Uh, I, I'm not re answering your question, sorry, but... <laughs> <laughs> Hi there. You, you talked a lot about um, getting feedback from customers. Yep. Um, I, I guess there's two questions. One is, how do you identify potential customers within your team? And then how do you have that conversation and, and what's, the, what's the process? Uh, to identify customers, what you need uh, first is, before you call them customers, you need to engage them as uh, friendly users. Also people that you turn into co-designers of your product. Yeah? It's about... you. Know, Leveraging contacts, leveraging, um, for example, the wire, the incubator, is kind of facilitating this kind of contacts for startups. Yeah, it's kind of getting in touch with people from which, from from whom you are not expecting anything but feedback and helping you drive your product in the right direction. Of course, if you do your a proper job, you are going to get up converting this prospect and user, uh, so friendly users into customers. But you cannot go uh, start very, you know upfront just say, well, I want to sell you this idea. You need to kind of convince and make people um, part of the journey. Yeah. Um, I have another question with respect to, uh, to open data. And yesterday there was an example of, uh, I think in the US, of, of cabs sharing the data, where they're picking up and bringing people to. And, and that's kind of public information which is out there. Um, there has been a, a bit of a debate uh, yesterday evening how, how people use this data. I, I wonder, how, how do we protect those data being misused as well? And, and I, I just put it out there. If you get the bad guys, they could use that to do more harm than they could do before. So how do you balance this open data with the danger that there is with the data becoming open? Um. Difficult question, because w which kind of control mechanism do you want to? If you open it, it is open. Uh, op opening data is binary. It's a binary state. It's either available or not available. Yeah. So you need to, you need to take the decision whether you open it or not before. Once this information is there, it's accessible to everybody by definition. So putting a control mechanism um, later, I don't I, I don't see it working. To be honest, no, what I'm saying is, uh, before you go and release your data, yeah, and I'm the you know the best friend of open data. Don't take me wrong, yeah, but you need to think about the implications, and this implication might not be clear because again, your data makes sense if you combine it with other data, yeah. So you need to kind of understand the com the the power of combination, how your data can be combined with other sources out there, yeah before you even go and release it. But a prone is really difficult to, to predict as well, so it's, again, it's not clear. Um. Uh, I think it's connected with the right to be deleted. Uh, do you support such functionality in your implementations? Because when somebody finds that his data are misused on your platform, mm -hmm. do you support activities like delete all, all my data on your servers. We are working with a, a black list and white list, so I think it's supported. It never happened to us, so I, we didn't ever have a request on that, but uh, technically it's possible. Uh, sorry, one more for me. Yeah. Um, f from your job in O2, where do you see the most exciting opportunities in data science? Most exciting opportunities in data science um, let me just uh, share with you where we are now. Yeah, we are now in the. Um, we look back, and we make sense of the past. Yeah, the more exciting opportunities are going to come when we just uh, decide to. M when we decide we've understood well enough the past to move and jump into predictive model, predictive modeling, because it's going to help a lot in many social causes, many, for example, just uh, to prevent. Um, to r minimize the risks in, in big concentrations of people, yeah, big, for example, big events. If, you, if we manage to create predictive modeling of these situations, then we can even put the proper measures in place to avoid 
problems or incidents. So for me, the, the looking into the future is the more exciting part. Mm -hmm. Hi. Hi. Um, just uh, related to that uh, question, um, regarding pre these predictive uh, models, have you seen many startups uh, working on that, like uh, customer churning prediction or something like that? Unfortunately not. Is that like uh, worldwide or just in Spain and Germany? Uh, and Germ well, the I'm, I don't know very well the startups in the US. But my experience is kind of uh, it relates to Spain, Brazil, um, UK, and of course Germany. And there, I wish we had more people just doing this kind of nice stuff. But um, yeah, what what I see is people are people are really aware of the importance of the data, and that's good. Yeah, and people are also aware of um, using the data to improve their products, like. A, coming up with recommendations like uh, facilitating the you know ads but uh, relevant for customers that's something very extended but in terms of creating predictive modeling they see it as phase 2 or phase 3 of their development as not as uh, as the first priority so you would say the what stopping is the, like lack of resources so no no like it's planning the, the priority of it but no, no, it's, it's not. It's, it, they're startups. Yeah? They're startups. They, they don't just. Um, they see it way. They see it way too fussy. I think that's my own my feeling. Yeah, and they want to get something more concrete, uh, more tangible, quicker. And then this fussy feature-like stuff, they kind of delay for later. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Any more questions? No? Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Juan, for a great presentation and the answers. Thank you all for being here. Let's give another round of applause to Juan Bernabe. Thank you, everybody. Pleasure being here. Okay. The stage is closing now until 2 o'clock, and our next talk will be by Jonathan Forit on collaborative and sustainable consumption. You're all welcome to come back here at 2 o'clock. Thank you.